Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Polish, and I serve as the Clean Energy Resource Team's or CERTS Director um, for the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. I want to welcome all of you to our energy storage session this afternoon. And as we kick off, I want to acknowledge that um, with the speakers before we started today, we are acknowledging that this is, a, this is a tricky time for all of us and we have a lot of feelings as we come into the session today, which is part of what motivates us to be here and talk about a clean energy transition and how that can be a just transition and be inclusive of everyone. Uh, today, we are digging in on our second energy futures session of the year, again, focused on energy storage. Um, we've been hosting these sessions with the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment, though we are sad to say that Akisha Everett, who is the project manager for the Energy Storage Project, is unable to be with us today. And in her stead, we have Jessica Hellman, the director of the Institute joining us. Welcome, Jessica. Um, we kicked off the storage series in February, really thinking about in that first event, what is the big picture of energy storage? What is that expansive term? potentially include and what does that future storage market look like for Minnesota and the Midwest? And we'll have a link to that event here so that you can go back and listen to it as you're interested. Today, we're taking a tighter focus on battery storage and particularly the concept of community scale battery storage. And, and just to remind folks um, that may have attended last time and for some of you who didn't, this is actually hoping to tee up a longer workshop that we're gonna host in June, focused on community scale storage case studies and then use cases to help all of you start to think about and prep for your own projects and how you might drive that forward. Um, briefly, before I introduce our speakers, I wanna just touch on a couple of different things that we've been looking at as we prep for this session. Um, probably many of you have seen that there are lots of energy storage studies out there, lots of different reports, lots of people thinking about it from utilities to developers to communities. And I think one of the things to just keep in the back of your mind today as we dive in is just how quickly this market is changing. So the Minnesota Department of Commerce did a 2013 storage study. They did a 2019 storage study. There's already you know, lots of other studying happening. And I think it's just remarkable the pace of change. At our last session, there were lots of really interesting questions from folks about Great River Energy's um, proposed partnership with Form Energy, which is really looking at that long duration storage and, and really looking at a flow battery spinoff that's at 150 hours. And that sort of speaks to like, where is storage going, right? And thinking about that, that long term. One of the other things that I was curious to learn is that um, in some of the filings for Excel Energy's integrated resource plan, there are some alternate filings that are already projecting 1.3 gigawatts of storage by 2035, which is a massive scale. And in a session that I attended just on Monday, I heard that within the MISO queue right now, 12% of what's in the queue is battery storage alone. And that just really speaks to sort of where we're headed, right, already and moving quickly. And all this to say that there is a lot going on in this space and that I think the community scale storage project that Akisha and all of the folks here today have been leading is really uniquely positioned to look at that community scale. So for all of you attending, let me, let me remind you that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A button. You are more than welcome to add your questions into the mix. We would welcome that. We have a whole bunch of questions that we wanna talk about, but we wanna hear yours too. And without further ado, let me introduce our guests. So Jessica Hellman is the director of the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment. As the director, she provides strategic leadership for the Institute, a mission-based organization working to help build a future where people and planet prosper together. The energy storage project that we're discussing today is based at the Institute on the Environment, and thus Jessica has the good fortune of working with Akisha. Jessica joins us today as an ambassador for the project and as a co-host and moderator. And knowing what she does about the project, she has lots of good questions. <laughs> so we're looking forward to hearing those. We are also delighted to have with us Jamez Staples and Ralph Jacobson, who are also leads in this project. Jamez is the founder and owner of Renewable Energy Partners. He is a fierce proponent of renewable energy resources and an advocate of the green economy. His company's mission is to pair the economic opportunity of climate change mitigation strategies with careers for the underserved, growing the green collar economy. 
Renewable Energy Partners, a certified minority business enterprise, provides full service renewable energy development. And REP's sister company, Northgate Development, has a long-term commitment to develop their regional apprenticeship training center in North Minneapolis as a centralized career and technical education center for Twin Cities students and adults. Ralph is the Chief Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer at Impact Power Solutions. Ralph founded IPS, formerly known as Innovative Power Systems, in 1991 on three principles. Use standard construction methods so other people can understand what we did. Two, leave a trail of happy customers to build confidence in the solar industry. And three, cultivate good working relationships with utilities. Since that time, they have completed over a thousand renewable energy projects and are one of the top US solar contractors. His company's mission is to lead the transition away from fossil fuels toward renewable energy power while saving money for their customers. He's more recently been working with a finance model based on crowdsourced debt and has been studying energy storage markets around the country in anticipation, not only of this session, but also of distributed <laughs> solar and storage deployment that they can lead. So with that to start, Jessica, how about we begin with you and maybe you can start us off describing a little bit more about the energy storage pilot project, talking about what community scale means and what you've been learning. Thanks so much, Lissa. And first I gotta acknowledge that I'm a very poor substitute for Keisha, but uh, I'll do my very best to set some background for her work um, and why it is so important and, and set the stage for these two stellar speakers that we have today. So I know many people on this um, webinar uh, probably have a good understanding about what energy storage is and why we're seeking to advance it. In particular, it's an emerging option for residential and commercial customers. Why? Because we want backup power in the event of an outage failure, but we also, um, and we want to do that in a way that's not, say, diesel generators that are dirty and noisy and have adverse health impacts on communities. Um, but these renewable or these other energy storage systems that are distributed and they are behind the meter, these are energy resources that give the people who possess them and use them greater control over their energy consumption, over energy flow more broadly, um, taking advantage of production when it's available and demand and price fluctuations that, uh, over time. And this is, provides a suite of values that it's sometimes hard for individual households to um, invest in for themselves, but at the community scale, at the neighborhood or community level, it's possible for many individuals to come together to share those benefits and to share in the invest the expense of the investment. So it's a scale that is larger than the individual households, um, but much smaller than say utility scale. And it aims to capture those benefits, keep them local, provide autonomy and independence and share the benefits and the costs. There are a couple of important factors in how community scale uh, energy storage would be adopted in this sort of behind the meter way. Um, and that has to do with the cost of the battery um, uh, and also how to manage it and facilitate its integration and capture and distribute those values uh, and costs. And that was what this project was built to explore as well as a choice in battery technology. So literally, what does it mean to adopt this technology at the scale and use it and integrate it into the community? So we'll hear more there about uh, available um, technologies of uh, battery storage technologies, electrochemical batteries, including lithium ion and newer technologies like redox flow batteries. And this project is composed of three sites in here in Minnesota and Jemez and Ralph represent two of those sites. And you'll hear about how each of these communities had a different reason for wanting to include battery storage at the community scale, from solar integration to stabilizing load to providing resiliency and backup power. And each site also has had to think about different battery technology and sizing and the equipment and management systems necessary. So Jamez and Ralph are the experts about each of those things. Um, I'll just flag in the beginning, I know there are a number of 
interesting challenges that have emerged during this project, including some increased costs that came along in the form of tariffs that were imposed by the Trump administration. And there were some pandemic related stresses on the supply chain, um, which presented real challenges. And I know that Jemez and Ralph will share their adventures with those things along the way. So I'd like to ask the two of you, Jemez and uh, Ralph, to talk about your specific pilot, uh, how they're, yeah, talk about your specific pilots. Maybe we could start with you, Jemez. Um, can you, I know that you're just about ready to install, install your battery or sort of been on the cusp of doing that, I know for a little while, but can you talk about what is the system, how it's configured, what's it for? Sure. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, you know, I think I got to kind of set some level set here and give some broader context here is how, how this actually ties into um, what it is we're seeking to do on Plymouth Avenue, which is uh, integrate the latest and greatest technologies into an economically challenged community here in North Minneapolis. Um, and so acknowledging that training is, is, uh, is a bit far, uh, two hours away by transit one way. That's how the impetus of the uh, training center came about and all these wonderful things around battery storage, solar, stormwater management, and all these other, uh, these, these uh, climate mitigation strategies came to be came to bear at the site. So we, uh, we installed, installed 174, three or something like that kilowatts on the top of the training center this past year around September. Uh, we used PACE financing, shout out to PACE for that. Um, and, and then we also were uh, in, the, in the queue working with Jessica and, and the team at the uh, Institute on Environment around the idea how we could tie storage uh, to, the, to the solar system. And so we were through this process awarded these uh, this LCCMR grant, Legislative Citizens Committee on Minnesota Resources grant for these for these three projects, and um, you know the, the the installation of the solar system itself was was a training opportunity. It was our our uh, kind of our inaugural first <laughs> installation uh, of our own on site, and then to tie the battery storage system was was critical. Um, and so that we're still in that process. We are not doing the installation of the batteries ourselves. We have a contractor that we are working with. Um, but the intended use of the batteries, we, we actually we we um, saw it kind of. We work with our one of the local one of the local vendors here, with the concept of, under the construct of like it could potentially be the first virtual power plant in the in North America, utilizing a German company, Sonen, which is a Sonen battery, and we bought five Sonen batteries with the resources that we were allocated. And so the goal here for me was not only to bring solar and battery storage and you know heat pumps and 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 you know all these things to the to the community but just to just for them to be there but for them to also serve as a um, for the building itself to serve as a serve as a stem laboratory for uh, both youth and adults to learn about what climate change is but also how we can incorporate their engage them around what climate change is how they can actively participate in the emerging sector of the economy and earn revenue from this 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 space that's that's ever expanding, especially with the new administration. So, um, our our project is is uh, it's, <laughs> it's taking a long time, right? It's unfortunate, uh, but we will be uh, uh, operational, I would imagine, within uh, the next two to three months for sure. Um, because for me, it's about you know bringing these technologies and showing them how this how this works, but at the same time making it fully functional. How do we make sure that when, like in 2011, when there was a power outage uh, due to the tornado, how do we make sure that there's a place for people to safely go and charge their batteries, uh, charge their cell phone batteries, make sure that they have somewhere that they can at least go indoors that have lights and whatnot when the power is out. Um, in addition, because this is a part of a, a bigger strategy, which we are, we have a signed MO, uh, a letter of intent with the school district where we're gonna be incorporating a microgrid and, a, and battery storage and whatnot down the road. Um, on three Minneapolis public schools buildings, with, which will ultimately be just an expanded version of what we're doing here at the training center. How do we kind of show them what this is on a micro scale and then show them how, what the macro scale is and, and it can actually get much bigger than that. So, um, you know, for us, it's been, it's been a great adventure, if you will, it's, uh, it's <laughs> to say the least. Um, and we are excited to be a part of it as a person who still lives in the community and is focused specifically on helping not just my people, but people of the region at large, and even people out of the state that, that want to look through these projects as an opportunity 
to learn and see how they can replicate these things. We want to make sure that we are leading in that space. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I felt like I kind of touched on a few different areas. So thank you. Yes, you did. Uh, leadership. Definitely, you are a leader. So uh, Ralph, you've been working with the Red Lake Land of Chippewa. Uh, and, uh, and you have another storage uh, project underway. Maybe you could tell us about your um, the particular application there and uh, how the system was built and what it's work intended to do and the those kinds of particulars. Um, sure. I want to flag something that Jamez said that I think really bears lifting up and that maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, in, in a state like Minnesota, where we really do not have an energy storage market, I mean, it's kind of an, in the early adopter stage. How do we um, keep pushing the ball down the field, if I can use a kind of a sports analogy? And that's basically just getting your hands on it and, and getting a chance to work with it. And, uh, and I would say we should shy away from um, having the, uh, let's say the, the battery priesthood developed that get more people experienced. <laughs> How many people have replaced a battery in their car? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's... anyways. Um, so the, the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe um, have, the, you know, they have a commercial fishery. Um, the Red Lake uh, has walleye in it. And so they have a pretty, um, large um, dependence on, on that fishery for uh, a substantial amount of the income of the tribe. They sell all over the Midwest, uh, all over the Midwest, and the um, burning of coal to the West in the coal plants uh, in Montana and North Dakota, um, which create the electricity that they use and that a lot of communities in Northern Minnesota use, um, are putting mercury in the air, which then filters down into the waters of the Midwestern lakes. And so slowly um, over decades, the level of mercury is rising. And being as they are very um, connected, uh, just in terms of their culture, um, connected to the environment around them and in, in which they live, they see the long-term hazard here and they wanna do something about it. And so what's driving them is the pain of seeing their fishery being degraded by mercury. And they want to move away from coal as quickly as possible. And here's a community that's coming back from near genocide. I might uh, term it that um, um, 150 years ago. And um, they don't have a lot of resources to work with. And that's probably gonna be changing during the Biden administration. There's a lot of money coming down um, from through the DOE and, and other channels. So what, what we started down the path about four years ago, they were talking about, um, let's start working with solar. Uh, and they really view it as, uh, uh, let's say a platform for economic development, that if people in the tribe can learn about solar, you know, and, and um, go up the skill ladder, that there's, there's a lot of job potential there for people in the tribe, a lot of economic development. Okay, so the first thing we did when we really started uh, making a, a pretty ambitious plan for putting solar on a dozen buildings in the community. So this is a little bit different community scale. It's, it's the, the government buildings, the schools, the casinos. So the large buildings uh, is where the solar is gonna go first. Um, the utility told us right away when we, because I mean, we met with them and we thought, okay, they need to know about what the tribe is planning. Otherwise it's gonna be kind of a, a train wreck down the road here down the tracks. Um, and they said right out, we, you can't put any of that power back on the grid. We buy our power from our supplier, you know, the coal burner out there in Montana, um, you know, like a block of it 24 seven. And we have this chunk of unsold power in the middle of the daytime. So they have, where, where California has the, the duck curve, well, they have the duck curve um, because there's this unsold power. And, um, and so, where, when does solar come in? Middle of the day, right when they really can't use it. And so um, right from get-go, we had to keep it behind the meter. And so the, the use case for the, um, uh, the, the tribe in general is that um, if you're going to use a lot of solar to, let's say, get beyond 20 to 25% of your loads and say um, target 50 to 75% of the daily loads, you're gonna to have to store a lot of the power that comes in during the day and keep it behind the meter. And so that's been the driver for, for the, um, the 
what's going to be distributed storage. Um, that's the driver for the storage uh, to be coupled with the solar. Um, and the tribe actually uh, hopes that um, as these are deployed and uh, the, um, the say these dozen buildings uh, have the solar and storage that is operational, that they will actually be able to generate some business to business relationships with the utility and build a better relationship because they can sell grid services with that storage. Um, so that's one of the, um, let's say, tantalizing opportunities out in the future. Um, let's see, I wanted to also um, just mention that we chose the vanadium uh, redox flow battery um, for the building use cases here because um, I think that well, I know that Ellen Anderson, who had a big hand in, in uh, doing this, um, was very interested in seeing some other battery chemistries uh, applied where appropriate. And the lithium chemistries are really going down the cost curve much more quickly than all the other chemistries because it, the electric vehicle market, um, as it grows, there is a mass market for lithium chemistries and there really isn't a mass market for the other chemistries. But here we had you know, the, the tribe, which is going to be doing a dozen commercial scale uh, energy storage um, systems uh, coupled with solar. And so it seemed like this is a good opportunity for an early adopter situation, the tribe as early adopter to uh, go up the learning curve working with the vanadium flow battery. Um, which is one of the best chemistries for um, backup power. So at the government center, it's going to be backing up the, uh, the, the um, uninterruptible power supply for the IT center. They experience a lot of very short duration, but um, impactful power outages because they're at the end of the line mm -hmm. uh, of the Beltrami system. And, and so the, the storage actually just helps the UPS um, make it through a little longer duration um, uh, outages. And the, I, I guess the, the government um, officials that we met with just felt that that was the best use case mm -hmm. for this battery. I also have a system, um, the, a solar system, the, the second one in this series of 12 that I'm installing at the Workforce Development Center um, in Redby down, down the shore of Red Lake. And that is more the first use case that I talked about, which mm -hmm. is the ability to use a lot more solar and keep it behind the meter. Yeah, and I mean, thank you both. Uh, well, all three of you, Jessica, for sort of setting the stage for, for what the pilot was about, but for really getting into to more of what is sort of the, the place-based specifics of why are we doing this? <laughs> what is the motivation? What are we hoping to get out of it? what you know what is the actual that that notion of a use case is really important i mean i've heard you all talk about like why are you doing storage that matters a lot in terms of what you install and then how you set it up i want to ask one other just quick let, let's see if we can do this quickly if i said to you are we ready for prime time for storage in minnesota what would you say <laughs> Ralph, no. Okay, that was a quick answer. Jamez, you want to add anything else? I don't see why not. I think we need to get there. <laughs> I think sure. we're there. We need to move fast on it, you know? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that you have said is really important about a pilot is like figuring out how to move fast. One of the questions that has already come in in the Q&A and is one that we've talked about is, okay, so to move fast, what is that workforce development need to look like? And I mean, Jamez, you started to tee that up, but say a little bit more like specifically around storage, what do you see as some of those training needs to get us ready for prime time? I mean, first and foremost, people need to understand what it is and how it works um, and what the, what the significance of storage actually is. Once you start to understand that and then you tie it to, you know, you got a career pathway of, you know, you want to look at all the clean energy spaces, then you can start to kind of broaden out where you start and then where you finish, right? And you want, you can make a decision whether or not you want to go into storage. But I think it's imperative that first off, what it looks like physically to me, it needs to be more diverse, right? When I, you know, show up at some of these meetings, I'm one of one, <laughs> you know, and, and, and sometimes it's, there's a couple more there, right? Uh, and when I say a couple, I mean more like a, of diverse populations. Um, so that's the physical makeup. But what it looks like to me at large is um, the transition needs to, it needs to be equitable. It needs to make, we need to, 
to be to be frank with you, I think it needs the, that the newest technology needs to be deployed in some of the most economically challenged communities first, because what happens there is that it starts to change the narrative around what the opportunity looks like. In addition to, um, you know, bending that cost curve downward starts to happen. I mean, if we could find ways to subsidize those systems with some of those public resources that are out there, then when the costs start going down, it's more adaptable for other entities, more, some, more, some of the more affluent people too, right? But that first pilot in some of these challenging communities, should, I think it should happen there. Um, and as far as the workforce goes, um, you know, you got to take it how you, how you, I mean, whether you're a younger person or an older person, I think it's imperative that there's a pathway. Um, and so like, you may not necessarily want to start with battery storage. I mean, you may want to start with solar. You may want to start with wind. You may want to start with the, the heat pumps, but showing them how these, how it all kind of rounds out and fits together is imperative because without necessarily, you don't necessarily need to know all of the, all, all things about energy, but you need to know where you want to start and where you want to finish and at least creating that pathway and that pipeline, be it at the public school system, at the, at the K-12 system. Uh, laddering into the uh, to the to the uh, community college technical space, all the way up to the university or, or the other uh, colleges that are out there. So I mean, it's it's a it's it's kind of a, a mixed bag about how we get there, but I think it's imperative that we kind of like it has to look and has to feel organic as we do it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I right. think that yeah, respond uh, to that. Or... Yes, and let me just add one quick thing before you respond. This notion of designing with intentionality so that we work with people who need it most first, <laughs> yeah. I think is really interesting. And Ralph, I mean, I, I want you to comment a little bit on like having watched how solar has developed <laughs> um, lessons learned for how we can do maybe do it differently. And maybe to even just say something about like how similar solar and storage are. I mean, Jamez is talking about like, we need to understand what this is and it is different, right? So say a little bit more. Yeah. Um... In terms of workforce development, first of all, just to um, cover that, um, the tribe, is, I mean, we're looking at not only the boots on the roof, the boots on the ground, people who are installing. I mean, there's the workforce development uh, um, plan is, is pretty ambitious at Red Lake. But think of all if, um, so they're talking about forming a tribal utility. So as, as our financing plan comes to fruition and these systems are, um, pass into the hands and ownership of, of the tribe. Um, they're going to own, um, well, these are energy producing assets as a utility would term it. And so uh, tribal utility, there has to be a cadre of people who understand what to do with that if they're going to actually have um, relationships with other utilities. And so think of all the skill sets that you can learn. And some would be ta taught at the Oshki Imajitada, which is like welding and, and uh, um, just solar installation, some electrical. But then there's, let's say, utility bookkeeping. Um, you know, all the things that utility executives deal with, um, contracts. Um, that's the kind of stuff that can be taught at the tribal college. Um, and so you look at the um, sort of the, the pantheon of skill sets that, that evolve around that ownership and uh, that's really, I think, where, where um, the more exciting part of economic development um, is up, up there in Red Lake. Um, the other question that you asked is that, uh, are they analogous? And I would say that storage is really a different animal. And uh, it's, uh, for one thing, it's dispatchable. And so it really needs to be treated as a, a utility type of asset. Um, the thing is, you can, you can store it. You can store solar power, you can store wind, then you can use it uh, in a variety of use cases. Um, and looking at the markets um, where there really is a market in other states, there's pain, as you um, sort of mentioned earlier, there's pain that has driven good policy to good programs um, in each case. And in Massachusetts and New York um, and elsewhere in New England, it has um, also partnered with the um, deregulation of the utility industry so that um, at any level, the, the players are more agnostic about where their power comes from, who they're buying it from. It's, it's like, does it meet their greenhouse gas reduction goals? And what about the price? And, and can they get their financing together? And so the pain of, um, let's say, um, just a lot of congestion on the grid. Uh, there was the pain of um, 
well, when there was a moratorium on new gas lines going through the New York metro area, so every new development in, uh, on Long Island and near upstate New York, they had to go all electric. No more gas, kids. Um, and so um, solar, they had uh, storage fit into that, um, that scenario very well. And so uh, they quickly um, developed uh, a market there. We don't, I, I don't wish upon Minnesota any of that kind of pain, but I would say one kind of pain that we have is watching the planet um, suffer from um, you know, our use of fossil fuels. And, and so if we could harness that and, and uh, get the utilities to, um, well, okay, so focusing on the use cases that can be valued highly enough to make it financeable, then we can de-emphasize price a little bit like they have out, out in New England where they have a bring your own device model. You, you, right. you buy it, you install it, and then there's somebody that will take it to the market. And, and generally that pain has been at the ISO level, the regional ISO level. And, and so the, the uh, markets um, at the ISO level, that's the wholesale market. Um, let's say a year ago, where there was a, an expectation that the um, investment tax credit was gonna be re reducing, which mm -hmm. now it's not for a little while, um, that the wholesale price would be able to um, prop up the financeability enough and offset that reduction in the ITC. Now, I guess we don't have to worry about that, but it's expected that the wholesale market is going to have the, um, the let's say the, the pain points that, that um, uh, make for higher revenue streams right. so that price doesn't right. matter so much. Right. Okay. I know Jessica wants to come back to this, like, what are the levers that we can think about in Minnesota? But let me ask you a couple quick. Okay, we're going to seriously, people, rapid fire. Okay. So quickly, Jamez, there is a clarifying question. Your sun and batteries are being used for demand peak shaving. They're being used as virtual power plants. Both. Can you just like quickly answer that one? Both. Um, obviously, power is the most expensive because everybody's asking for it. So we want to, you know, use, utilize that power, cycle those batteries on and off uh, at those peak power production moments, uh, peak peak cost. In addition to the virtual power plant, the virtual power plant, we have five different batteries. They will all operate as their own individual houses connected to a quarter of the array that's on the roof of the building. So they will have their own. Each individual battery will, will be charged. It will operate as if it were like somewhere else in the community. And it would, you know, kind of be able to do peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. So mm -hmm. um, kind of, I hope that answers the yep, question. Rapid great. Fire. No, that's good. Okay, Ralph, really seriously, briefly, advantages, disadvantages, lithium and vanadium flow. Well, lithium is the price, you know, it's cheaper. Cheap, um, okay. And uh, the vanadium is more appropriate for uh, um, fixed building applications, mm -hmm. less fire hazard, um, you know, that's, that's a big one yep. when you're putting it in a building. No, that's great. Okay. I want to, there's one other one just quickly. Uh, are you all eventually going to be open for tours? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's um, a four and a half hour drive up to Red Lake, but I'm sure they'd love to. They'd be uh, happy to have Once you. COVID has passed, they're yeah. very cautious about having people in. Right yeah. Now. Okay. Jessica, you had some questions about sort of like what would make Minnesota ready. Go ahead and ask yours. Well, Jamez made this comment already about being a leader and leading from North Minneapolis. So, I mean, I think of both of you in this project as um, in your communities as exemplars and leaders, but maybe someday you won't be, you know, we'll look back and say you were the trailblazers, but what needs to change or what needs to happen so that what you're doing isn't so remarkable, like mainstream. I think that um, we'll see. We'll need to see more investment in these kinds of projects and have them happen more frequently. Um, and again, as I said, I think that you know, for me, I think that these 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 investments should be made in economically challenged communities. So we should be targeting specifically these communities, be it uh, battery storage, electric vehicles, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, um, subsidizing the cost of acquisition of, of EVs for economically challenged communities because we are the people. Uh, people from these communities drive the most inefficient vehicles as far as the mm -hmm. gas mileage, as well as even the possibly the the uh, the, the um, uh, exhaust systems, right? So, you, know, you might. Oh yeah. <laughs> so when you you may hear a car buzz by here that, that sounds like the mufflers off of it, right? You probably don't hear that in Edina all that often, right? 
Um, but in addition to that, you know, you think about the, the I mean, our, our city is fairly dense. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we need to be figuring out how to incorporate more heat pumps and things like that in, in a centralized location in the alley so that more people can type directly to those heat pump systems. Uh, a shout out to uh, Jimmy and those guys at Darcy Solutions that are uh, cultivating that, that technology with those very smaller, small, uh, the more dense um, heat, the, the wells that they have to drill for those heat pumps. Um, so, I mean, these are, the, these are the kinds of technologies that we're trying to see happen. Uh, and to get here, we need to see more, right? We need to have these, these, this, this federal stimulus money that's coming down the pipeline it needs to be it needs to be targeted, and they say that forty percent of it's supposed to go to economically challenged communities. I want to see it, right? I want to see the same thing around the workforce stuff. I mean, they say this, but <laughs> will we actually see it, right? I mean, a lot of people do it. exactly. There's a lot of talk. I had a lot of people tell me a lot of things along the seven and a half year journey when I've been working on this training center, <laughs> and you'll be surprised at how many people actually show up when it's time to when it's time to go to the dance. So, I'll, I'll let I'll let Ralph take it from there. Um. So one of the things that is really going to enable Red Lake uh, to, let's say, move, move uh, into the position, the, like the tribal utility that they envision is connectivity. So although we like to think that having our means of power production from the sun is going to make us independent, it makes us uh, wish to be more connected than ever. And so Red Lake it just got a grant to really um, get that connectivity between isolated parts of the reservation and all the buildings. It's not like a typical main street of a city where you have a main street and, and a lot of buildings. It's very spread out. And so on that, they want to keep it that way. And so the connectivity allows everything to talk to everything else. That's going to be a huge enabler for um, smart grid, for being able to control storage, for being able to um, implement the virtual power plants so that like a school of minnows that all swim in the same, you know, just getting all these little power um, um, storage areas uh, or, or um, uh, devices to be able to work together to, uh, let's say, provide a function into the, um, the wholesale grid um, or to meet, you know, some demand, some, ch some challenge that, that, that arises. So you're suggesting also sort of enabling infrastructure, which is also something requiring an investment into directed and directed to particular communities also. Matt? Yep. Yeah. So there are a few questions in the chat and this always comes up. Um, you're talking about investment and some people are asking, well, but it still feels like it's really expensive or <laughs> lithium ion is expensive for long duration this is expensive for this, it's too expensive for this. Can you say a little bit about how much these systems cost? I know it was well, a pilot, I know it was a tricky year, but yeah. <laughs> well, our, um, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but our battery cost is right around 55,000 for these five batteries. And so, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's up there, but at the same time, you know, the, the benefits right and the the grid services in addition to you know the idea that we're looking at you know how do we stop overproducing and not using enough so i mean we can be more efficient right efficiency is the key <laughs> i mean efficiency is the ideal it's kind of like energy efficiency should be prime should be the first thing before you even do solar right so let's think about this and, and put this into context and when you there's a there's a business case to be made about all these things, right? I mean, there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a the, the curve, right? That everybody makes reference to in terms of, and then there's a there, then the cost starts going down when we reach that when we reach that. Um, uh, you're drawing a blank on what I'm trying to say here, but you know, you got a cost, and then at at some point the cost starts going down, and when we get more broader adoption, you know, that's when we start to see the cost come down. Uh, you know, something that I had uh, wanted to say is that Minnesota, what I've found is that Minnesota is, is uh, a flyover country for um, most uh, suppliers of uh, storage equipment in the modern uh, mature markets, because here we are in the middle of the continent and somebody who does most of their business in California or New York, Massachusetts, um, there's more tech support that is needed um, for a battery system, an energy storage system. Um, and they're reluctant to um, get uh, sell a one-off. 
So what we thought was if we buy, you know, the University of Minnesota Morris bought two, we, um, we have one at the government center, one at Oshki. So that's four that we, we try to get critical mass so that the, uh, the supplier, you know, has, uh, can justify spending some company resources supporting this. I mean, you know what happens when your software and your computer, when they stop supporting it, it's like, oh, I got to go buy something. Well, we, we want to make sure that we uh, have uh, robust support for the controls and the batteries as we go up our learning curves, uh, understanding how they work. Yeah, and you're hitting on some of the other questions. I mean, people are saying, yeah, it's the upfront cost is one thing, but then how to maintain it. I, I mean, I also, I mean, you've all been talking a little bit about controls. And there are a couple of questions here about oh. ancillary services too. So can you speak yeah. a little bit about the other? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, the front end. The first thing you mentioned, front end cost. Um, so if you look at a, a lithium ion battery uh, set that might need to be replaced in a 25 year uh, contract period once or twice. So you actually, if you do a life cycle costing, maybe that's three um, battery sets that you're talking about. Um, so with uh, flow batteries, which are, it's like a swimming pool with uh, electrodes and an electrolyte solution that is, you know, changing state or changing, you know, its electrical, electrochemical characteristics all the time uh, as it's charged and discharged. Um, maybe that's a, a, a system that is only installed once, but then you replace the fluid in it or replace the, some of the components in it. And so the life cycle cost might be more comparable. So that's one thing. So I, I, I'd like to back that up with the idea that, you know, we're, these pilots are pilots, right? We are where we are within the technological cycle. And we got scientists and the National Science Foundation is going to continue to supply and support, you know, innovation and technology. And I think we need to be cognizant of the idea that where we are today is not where we will be in 10 years. So we need to be preparing mentally and even physically for the infrastructure improvements that they actually take place and setting these and setting up these be it the existing infrastructure in terms of residential neighborhoods or the future infrastructure of commercial uh, properties that can utilize this technology but also be swapped out with the new stuff as it becomes more readily available and at lo lower costs. Um, I mean, the cost of a battery today does not necessarily, I mean, look at what the cost of a battery was 10 years ago, right? I mean, look at what the cost of solar was 10 years ago. <laughs> I mean, we're, we have dropped the cost of solar, I mean, what, 80%? So, I mean, we need to be thinking forward thinking. We need to be thinking about what's happened in the past, where we are today, but we need to be leaning forward into all this stuff. And that's what I encourage all the utilities in addition to people like myself, Ralph, the university and other entities that are exploring the idea of getting involved with storage and all the other technologies that are out here. Because uh, without it, you know, we don't advance. And the same thing with the workforce. If we don't start moving forward on like getting the next generation, the existing generation that's here now prepared for the next iteration, of the technology, we will always be st st stagnant, right? I mean, we're watching other countries bypass us with all these new innovative technologies and things that they're doing, even the workforce. You go over to Germany and the, <laughs> their kids at the high school level are being prepared for a career pathway. If they choose to exercise it or not, they got it. So we need to be doing the same. I don't, it, it just, it's just mind boggling. It's kind of like the chicken or the egg thing around here. And it's just like, look, start, start leading. When did the U.S. stop leading? Some time ago. We need to get back to the front of that. I mean, it's like, come on. I follow the pain is my mantra. I went over to Germany in 2005 to see why it was that they um, had that buy-in or the feed-in tariff. Yeah. Well, the guy at the Fraunhofer Institute um, told me, we get our natural gas from Russia. Every time they stick it to the Ukraine and shut off the valve, we're down here burning the furniture, trying to keep okay. warm. And so they said, okay, solar is one of our own resources. Let's use it. Right. And I think that we have, as you have all demonstrated, an opportunity right now that we can seize. And that is part of that future. Friends, we are already at time. I sense Jeez. that we could go for hours. <laughs> And I know that in the feedback that we get from folks, they will say, you didn't have long enough. So go ahead and fill that out in your response to all of us. Um, we will be sharing a survey. And, and I mean, in this last moment, I wanna just say thank you so much, Jamez and Ralph and Jessica. Uh, I know we all wish, wish Akisha had been here too. And we are looking forward to having her back in June when we have another session. 
you all put some really great questions in the Q&A and I want to promise you that what we did last time is we shared out a recording and then we actually answered more of the questions. So we'll be sending those around to our speakers because I think that they have ability to answer some of those other questions. So we'll get them answered and get those responses out to you. We will share a recording. We would very much appreciate it if you would fill out the event survey. And we hope that you will join us for a much longer session, more like two, two and a half hours to dig into some of those opportunities with case studies and use cases to start to really think about your own projects because you all are part of, as Jamez was describing, this opportunity to lead. And this is the sort of like tee up, but now it's time to get to work. So thank you all for being yep. here. Thanks to all of you for joining us to thank speak. You. We appreciate it. Thanks for leading. Bye-bye, right. everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.